I'm going to give a brief content warning before I start. This episode contains discussions of police brutality and sexual assault. If that's not something that you feel comfortable listening to right now, I won't blame you if you don't listen to this episode. Hello, my name is Amber and this is You Look Like a Badger, a podcast where I discuss queer cinema. It is 2023 and last year I spent a lot of time discussing films that I really, really liked. So I was able to say a lot of nice things about queer cinema, give you some recommendations for some stuff to check out. For this season of the show... (laughs) I am going to be delving into some more controversial picks, some films that I might not like as much, or I might really like them, but these are films that have been considered controversial or offensive. There's usually been some discussion around them about the way that they represent the LGBT community, and I thought that would make for a really interesting season so I'd end up discussing a lot of films that have maybe had some discourse around them on the internet and then kind of disappeared and I thought it'd be good to use this podcast as a way to kind of revisit that discourse see where it's at whether it was justified or not maybe I'll end up finding some films that I really like I can't say that for this first episode but we'll, we'll get to that so if you didn't listen last year January is dedicated to the genre of historical fiction. So I look at queer cinema based on a fictionalized version of the past. I give like fun names to each of the months because it's it's my show and I can do what I want. So January, the title for January is We Have Always Lived in the Shadows. So it looks at films where you no know, queerness was probably there and then it like highlights it, puts it to the front. That's what historical fiction usually is for. This month's pick is an interesting one. Stonewall. People like Frank Cameron have been fighting this battle for years. No one's done as much for our cause as he has. What, by wearing a suit and tie? Come on, is, is that really what you want? What, just to blend in? I mean, we are different, right? But, you know, I'm beginning to realize just how different we really are. Yeah, like wearing a dress and prancing up and down Christopher Street? Hey, it takes a lot more balls to wear a dress than it does a suit and tie. Stonewall is a 2015 fictionalized version of the 1969 riots told from the perspective of Danny, a young gay man who has been kicked out of his family home and seeks refuge with a group of homeless queer misfits. Directed by Roland Emmerich, typically known for action-adventure movies, this film is a departure from the stories he usually tells, despite being a gay man himself. The film mostly fails to feel like a story of human struggle and instead comes across as a series of characters Characters stating laws against homosexuality out loud and educating the naive protagonist as he navigates his own identity. Much of the controversy of the film stems from its trailer, which circulated after it appeared to exclude people of colour and trans people from its narrative, despite the significant contributions to the liberation movement, and instead chose to centre white and cis experiences for the sake of drawing in a bigger audience. Having watched this film and witnessed the general vitriol aimed at this film, I was incredibly surprised to open Rotten Tomatoes and find that it had a critic score of 9%, which makes sense to me, but an audience score of 84%. That is insane, especially considering that this film has like almost no fan base anymore. When I logged it on Letterboxd, almost no one that I followed had seen it, and it and very few people have seen it in general. So I have to assume that this score is a bit skewed, (laughs) but who can tell? Speaking of Letterboxd anyway, it has a score of 2.1, which feels a bit more accurate. (laughs) I was looking through the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and I think it might have been the case that it was like review bombed positively on purpose because, because it was getting a lot of controversy around it so a lot of the pos- the more positive reviews seem to come from 2015 but I-, I do want to acknowledge the people that enjoyed the film so I have found two reviews and this is what they said Christian J said it's an important one and the story is compelling in its realism a reminder of what it was like to be gay in the 60s in America basically you were subhuman and that's pretty well depicted in this film go and see it as a docudrama and an emotional one this second review, kind of in a similar ballpark, um, from 
Armando P. Don't expect some documentary where you will learn all the detailed historical facts about what happened during that time in the gay liberation movement. However, you will be delighted by a lovely gay coming of age story set against that backdrop. It was definitely a story I could relate to. The rejection from family, meeting people you never thought you would, ending up in places that you never thought you would end up in. See, I want to respect these people's opinions. <laughs> With any movie, if you got something from it, that's great. I, having watched the film, I think there are just so many movies that have done this better. And I, I get the feeling that if, without sounding insulting, if you really liked this, then maybe you haven't watched a ton of queer media. <laughs> I didn't like this film. I know that opinions are subjective and that enjoying a film is fully up to you, but I just, I, <laughs> I just have one better for these people because I feel like there are just films that, that talk about what they want from movies better than what was happening with this one. Over to Letterboxd, the most popular reviews are not as nice. Before I, <laughs> before I read these, I do want to state that I'm not just picking people who agree with me. I, I want to try and find what the consensus is. And it's really hard to navigate Rotten Tomatoes actually, because you can't sort by most popular or highest rated. Like it just sorts it by date. I'm not saying that Rotten Tomatoes is a, like a bad website and Letterbox is good, but I do think it's, it just feels like a smidge skewed. So I want to give like balanced opinions and it does seem that this film was mostly received negatively, but Rotten Tomatoes doesn't reflect that. I'm going to read these letterbox reviews, which are both negative <laughs> and feel more aligned with what public opinion actually was of the film. So this first review is from Vanina, and they say that it's a very safe film made for people who have never bothered to familiarise themselves with LGBT history, not even a key moment such as this. Instead, it gives us a relatable lead and makes his less relatable friends petty thieves and drama queens. See, I agree with all of that except for the point of view that it's a safe film. Yeah, we're gonna come back to that. <laughs> I I think generic is a better word to describe it. I wouldn't say safe. I think it's deliberately trying to not be safe. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. This next one is from Juan. And they say, This is the most self-loathing queer film made by a queer individual about queer history ever made. Now, this is an opinion I also agree with. But I don't like making statements on directors personally. I don't know Roland Emmerich and how he feels about his own identity. So I do think that this film is very self-flagellating and very self-hating and that the way it depicts queerness is kind of miserable and there isn't really an alternative perspective from this, which was really frustrating to watch because there was no joy at all. It was just an onslaught of misery, which makes the film difficult to watch in particular because this film also doesn't really have any characters in it. They are just kind of talking points and I'll, I'll get into that in more detail in, in later sections. If you haven't <laughs> figured it out by now, I didn't like this film and it is for stuff that I've just read mostly. What I will say is that the historical inaccuracy is probably the least offensive part. So it is interesting that that's the part that people got hung up on. A lot of people got that perspective from just watching the trailer. I think that not a lot of people actually watched the film. They just got mad about the trailer and then didn't actually go and see the film, which, you know, is your choice. I wouldn't have supported this film, mainly because it's not very good. But I do think it's interesting the sway that in the internet can have on the success of a film. Also, trailers are very important. If you have a bad trailer, people are gonna hate your movie before it even comes out. <laughs> I think before I get onto the spoiler section, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the controversy regarding historical accuracy because I think it's important when we discuss fiction, I'll say it's important when we discuss historical fiction specifically, that when it comes to accuracy and inaccuracy that we're being nuanced because I think it's okay to take aesthetic liberties and kind of like judge 
your script a bit so that it, it follows a more streamlined story like a narrative so editing out bits of history to make your story more interesting or like consolidating characters into just one character so that you'd not got loose strings everywhere it's kind of part of the narrativizing of history but it is significant what people choose to leave out and very specifically if you are leaving out trans people from your narrative why are you doing that why are you pivoting to a character that didn't exist and moving away from characters that did why are you excluding them what is the purpose of that i have some theories <laughs> i think it's because white gay men are more palatable to straight audiences particularly if they are suffering which is what a lot of this film is but um i do think it's important to acknowledge people's perceptions of this film were false because there are black people in this film there are people of color in this film and there are trans people in this film i'm putting those in quotation marks because there are trans characters they are not played by trans people but the trailer did very much focus on the main character danny and that's what the film also focuses on i do want to acknowledge that when people were saying that these characters were excluded they were wrong partly they aren't excluded they are pushed off to the side though and that honestly might be more insulting and i'm gonna get into why in the later sections <laughs> this is where i'm gonna give my spoiler warning if you haven't seen the film and it's something that you wanted to watch i would not trust your judgment but it's up to you this might be a film that you like aching to watch and you don't want it spoiled by me <laughs> So I'm going to give you the opportunity now to pause this episode, go and watch the film. You can spend those two hours doing that if you want to, it is your choice. And then come back here to me and we'll finish off the episode, babe. Right? So I'll see you in a bit. What do you know about this? I told you I don't know nothing. And you're fucking lying to me because I can see it in your eyes. What are you protecting? This guy is a piece of shit. He kills kids. Help me, please. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Are all of you just stupid? Is that part of being gay? No, but getting fucked up by the cop show seems to be. Occasionally, when I've done these episodes, I've done like a kind of a preliminary section first before I start talking about the film, just to give a bunch of historical context because I'm aware that not everyone's gonna know the actual history of what happened or they're not gonna know the laws around queerness but considering we're talking about a very famous historical event it's probably a good idea to actually discuss what actually happened and i want to reiterate that i personally am okay if directors take certain liberties and they like consolidate information and make something more easy to watch i'm sure like a lot of historical events weren't as interesting as we want them to be like we have in order to like process information we have to add a kind of narrative to them i understand when people like cut certain things out but you know like i said earlier why were you cutting out people of color <laughs> Why were you cutting out trans people? What was the angle there? I am going to give an account of Stonewall and the context behind it. I'm drawing from several different sources, so I'm not going to list them off as I'm reading, but I will put all of the links in the show notes if you want to read them for yourself. The 1960s and preceding decades were not welcoming times for LGBT Americans. For instance, solicitation of same-sex relations was illegal in New York City. Homosexuality was classified as a mental disorder, and most municipalities in the United States had discriminatory laws that forbade same-sex relationships and denied basic rights to anyone suspected of being gay. The New York State Liquor Authority penalised and shut down establishments that served alcohol to known or suspected LGBT individuals, arguing that the mere gathering of homosexuals was disorderly. Engaging in gay behaviour in public, e.g. holding hands, kissing or dancing with someone of the same sex, was still illegal. So police harassment of gay bars continued and many bars were still operated without liquor licenses, in part because they were owned by the Mafia. Stonewall Inn quickly became an important Greenwich Village 
institution. It was large and relatively cheap to enter. It welcomed drag queens who received a bitter reception at other gay bars and clubs. It was a nightly home for many runaways and homeless gay youths who panhandled and shoplifted to afford the entry fee. And it was one of the few, if not the only gay bar left that allowed dancing. Its patrons were among the most marginalized members of New York's LGBTQ community, including underaged and unhoused individuals, people of color and drag performers. Onto the riots. In the early hours of the 28th of June in 1969, New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn. Armed with a warrant, police officers entered the club, roughed up patrons and found bootlegged alcohol, arrested 13 people, including employees and people violating state's gender-appropriate clothing statute. Female officers would take suspected cross-dressing patrons into the bathroom to check their sex. Fed up with the constant police harassment and social discrimination, angry patrons and neighbourhood residents hung around outside of the bar rather than dispersing, becoming increasingly agitated as the events unfolded, as people were being aggressively manhandled. At one point, an officer hit a lesbian over the head as he forced her into a police van. She shouted to onlookers to act, inciting the crowd to begin throwing pennies, bottles, cobblestones and other objects at the police. One person fighting for her rights was Marsha P. Johnson, a black transgender woman and activist who frequented the bar and is considered one of the leaders of the rebellion. Although some claim Johnson threw the first brick at the police. She maintains that she didn't get to the bar until the melee was in full swing. An important historical event for LGBT rights in the US, it led to the creation of the Gay Liberation Front. As I've been reading through historical sources, I think historians have become a bit frustrated with the narrative that the riots were entirely populated by trans people of color and though they were there and they have always been a significant part of the movement it's not true that they were the only ones fighting and it seems to be kind of wishful thinking on the part of modern interpreters of history a lot of people would like to think that this event and maybe a lot of other events were more inclusive than they actually were um i think it, it's a big part of just wanting these people to be recognized for the contributions that they made even if it means kind of going fully the other way and wrongfully interpreting history that is not to say that this film is correct in the way that it chose to represent stonewall particularly with the riots from the research that i did the scene in the film where they can can in front of the riot police apparently really did happen it is apparently accurate but i think i'm less interested in if the scenes with the riot actually happening happened as they actually did and I'm more interested in how it's framed because for some reason a decision was made that the police were given equal time, equal screen time to, to the queer people outside. So it keeps cutting back and forth to the police trying to barricade the doors from these angry queers who are trying to kill them and it cuts back to and the people outside who are very rightfully angry and they're rowdy and they're throwing bricks and they're setting things on fire. And I think the specific framing of this dynamic where the police are equally terrified, kind of like Pocahontas, you know, how Native Americans are just as are just as evil as as the as the white settlers obviously i haven't seen pocahontas in a really long time but i can't imagine it it's it's aged very well like that there's a there's a song where both the white colonizers and the native americans are, are singing like savages savages and that's kind of what this feels like like the <laughs> the police are equally as afraid of the, the evil queer people. They're just an unruly mass of homosexuals trapping them in a bar. And you know, the other side of that is that we've seen gay people being harassed by the police, being forced into homelessness and addiction. And this is, this is their final reckoning, except it doesn't feel like that at all because we keep cutting away from them. And that is like made doubly more significant because there are no characters in this film. I have a section later on in the podcast, but one of the most frustrating parts of this film is that it refuses humanity. Th there are no people in this film. These are just like walking, this is just walking dictionaries for anti 
homosexuality laws. These are not people. Which is why it is frustrating that even in the midst of the riots, where we are meant to be unequivocally anti the police who have been so violent and oppressive and it does this thing where we just keep cutting back and forth between them when you have the context of oppression and you're giving equal time to the oppressors i think that is significant especially if we're talking about accuracy because accuracy i think can be very subjective i think from the perspective of the police, yeah, these are angry queer people who are trying to kill you maybe because you've been murdering them and putting them in prison and beating them senseless. And that level of violence is so much more significant than, than this one instance of rioting. It is very interesting that we have this very, like, moderate centrist approach to Stonewall which when you're telling a story from the point of view of LGBT characters is a terrible way to do your film that's just the truth we don't want equal time with the police we don't like the police in the context of this film they're not doing a good thing once you realize what you really were you had to run away from home to find your ass and quick and what am I but well, you certainly didn't come to Christopher Street for the pizza. I didn't run away from home. Kicked out. Hey, look, run away, kicked out. All that really matters is, is now you're here, right? And you don't know what is what. Welcome to New York. This film is probably what we call misery porn. This film has very little to say about queer joy. I would also argue it doesn't have that much to say about queer misery, but it definitely likes depicting it. The more I watch films, the more I like engage with fiction, the more I'm like, depicting something isn't enough. I want you to have something to say about it. And I think that is true even of historical fiction. The film does a lot to kind of set up the context that we talked about earlier of what perceptions of gay people were and there is like there's a particular like real film that went out about how older gay men prey on children and how this was like shown in schools to make sure that you don't go off with any gay men and that gay men are inherently a danger to children i think using this you know, it, it's it's useful. I think it's kind of a cliche, I think, at this point, because, I don't know, I feel like I've seen that film so many times. But, you know, this is 2015, maybe. It was less around then. My main opinion of this film is that it doesn't have much interesting to say. And the things that it does say have been said, like, a lot. See, here's my thing about criticising queer media in particular is I don't want to sound like dismissive or ungrateful or that I'm taking stuff for granted but I do also just want good quality <laughs> you know I don't want to have to like take the scraps that people decide to throw my way when they decide to make queer films and I'm not against talking about difficult or more terrifying aspects of being gay like hate crimes happen and people get kicked out of their houses and sexual assault also happens i'm not against depictions of that or discussions of that but i do take issue with a lack of effort and a lack of interest seemingly because it feels like this is so generic and just like plotted out that it's so hard to engage with and it's so boring to engage with like on the surface of it having the father figure as a gay man's worst nightmare because he is like the beacon of heterosexual masculinity and the closeted gay man cannot face that person because of that and that you know we're talking about 50s and 60s masculinity which is a very specific kind of masculinity that can be really interesting but 
nothing is done with it. This film could have had some interesting stuff to say about white heterosexual masculinity and what that comes up against. The closest thing we get is just kind of the juxtaposition of Danny's like home life, what that's like, and then what it's like being in the gay clubs around cis men and drag queens and trans women, all of whom are playing with ideas of gender. That was kind of interesting, but I wouldn't argue that anything is done with it. We get like lip service, you know, Danny says it takes more balls to wear a dress than a suit and tie. And then that that's kind of the end of it. Danny doesn't go on a gender journey. He doesn't venture that much outside of his own perceived ideas of the binary between heterosexuality and homosexuality. It's not it's not a film about self-exploration. It feels like a series of bullet points being listed out. <laughs> And what that culminates in is just depictions of misery. Every single setting is precarious and dangerous. You are like one step away from addiction and homelessness. There are like really violent portrayals of police brutality and attempted sexual assault. There is an explicit scene of sexual assault in the film. We see that all of these, these uh, gay people are uh, living in one apartment. There's like 12 of them in there they like sleep in a pile we either see them getting beaten up by the police or we see the aftermath of it and it just it feels like an onslaught of that for about 90 minutes and then the last half an hour i'd say is the depiction of the actual riots i want to give the director the benefit of the doubt because i have read what he had to say about the film so he did an interview with ew where he said i was involved in the la gay and lesbian center and they told me that 40 percent of all homeless youth are gay which is a disproportionate amount that was like the bridge to today it's still going on Gay kids get thrown out of their homes and become homeless. And my movie is like a story of one of these kids who gets involved with the whole Stonewall riots because the riots were actually kind of done by the kids. A lot of them were homeless. They were hustlers, kids who had nothing to lose. See, when I read something like that, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense why you wanted to focus on these people. But the problem is that it's very limited by the fact that there aren't characters in this film <laughs> and I know I've said that like a few times but I wouldn't argue that any of these characters feel like real people so when you're just showing me them getting like beaten up or trafficked into sex work all I'm seeing is just a bunch of misery and that in itself feels like the filmmakers telling the truth of what they think being queer is. You know, maybe it was the fact that they thought straight audiences would want to see that. <laughs> maybe it would confirm some stuff they thought. I've watched queer films with hate crimes in them and not come away kind of as offended as I was with this film because they thought about those characters as real people and not just pawns for ideology. And I think that's where a lot of people switched off. It's where I switched off, if I'm being honest, because I remember getting into this film, I'd been kind of waiting for something like significant for Danny's character to happen because we'd seen a lot of backstory for him getting kicked out and then it would cut back and forth between the reality of the world where he was in New York trying to live his life. And all it felt like was the film just confirming that being gay is miserable <laughs> and nothing else really. There is no real joy in this film. I would argue that Ray and Kong and also Marsha P. Johnson are probably the closest we get to like queer joy. However, they are not really big significant characters. I'd say Ray is the most significant out of the ones that I mentioned. Even then, their queer joy is just like a few lines of sassy dialogue where they don't take shit and they just kind of get on with it. I'm going to get into how these characters kind of relate to Danny, but my point is that a lot of what the film seems to be is confirming Danny's point of view 
that now that he has been kicked out of his house his life is going to be a lot worse because he is now going to have to embrace his queer identity whereas if he had stayed home and he hadn't been outed then he could have just pretended to be heterosexual and lived a perfectly happy life like his friend i've forgotten his name is it johnny i've forgotten the name of the character <laughs> but there is Danny's best friend who he has sex with regularly he at the end of the film we see he's just living a straight life here is what the film is trying to say either all life is miserable because we all have to pretend to be something that we're not at some point or specifically queerness is miserable and if you are queer being made to be that is probably the worst thing that will ever happen to you and the fact that you can't ever go back into the closet is a nightmare. The film just seems to confirm a lot of fears around being gay and what it's like to be gay. It is true that a lot of trans women did end up being sex workers, right? So a lot of trans women, a lot of gay men and did end up hustling or doing sex work the way that this film depicts that is danny just kind of being thrown into it see here's the thing i don't think this film has a measured point of view on literally any topic so my point of view is that of course there are people who are made to do sex work there are people who don't have the choice to not do it but because this film just doesn't have any fucking chill we don't get that measured point of view everything is the worst and everyone is looking to exploit or offend danny in some way so whilst he is in new york he ends up homeless he's beaten up by the police he is sexually harassed by other gay people he is cheated on by his boyfriend he is trafficked into a sexually exploitative situation where you know he's kidnapped by the mob and made to engage in sex work and he also has to participate in riots where he's being beaten and assaulted by the police all of this happens in like the space of a couple of weeks i think it's, it's really hard to actually gauge how much time passes in this film but so much terrible shit happens to him in a small amount of time it honestly feels unrealistic the fact that this is based on on true events means it's unnecessary to depict this world like this and none of this would matter <laughs> i'm gonna say it once again if this script had people in it if, if this film had characters in it i, I wouldn't mind them showing like exploitation and discrimination i wouldn't mind it but the fact that this film has no interest in the actual people who went through this is what makes it one so frustrating and so fucking boring and repetitive because you're just seeing people being harassed and exploited over and over and over again with no kind of commentary on top of it is just depiction and once again i don't think depiction is enough i think a lot of people think that if they if they talk about something heavy or dark that automatically makes their film good it doesn't you actually have to have something to say about it and this film doesn't have anything to say it just thinks that being a member of the lgbt community is miserable and that there is no hope really and i'm not saying that there isn't misery there definitely is but with without that kind of measured and nuanced hand that i think this film really probably needed there isn't anything here of substance it it just it feels like a slog because there's nothing to emotionally weigh down the experience i think good intentions in this case were not enough listen this is only temporary because we could find a real place if i just made some real money I got a cousin who went to pharmacy school in California, you know, with Judy, Eliza, and Norna. They live there with a lot of palm trees. You could go to pharmacy school too. I can't go because I'm not smart like that, but I could make a nice home. I could clean, I could cook, I was going to boil. I could drive to the supermarket and a Chevrolet and I could buy groceries. I'd be so nice. 
I think we should circle back around to why people were angry about this film in the first place. Why, when they saw the trailer, they were pissed off because the main character was a cis white man, which is an annoying thing to say out loud now because the internet has ruined it, but that is just simply what the truth of the film is. <laughs> That's, that, that is what happened. Instead of centering other people's experiences, the filmmakers chose to centre on Danny, who is cis and white, and therefore the most marketable section of the LGBT community, the most profitable. We must keep making money for Hollywood is the only way for us to get rights. Along with the trailer, the director also kind of got pissed off with people because they were getting angry at a film that they hadn't seen, which I will say has to be annoying. I don't want to take shitty people's sides, but I don't know this man, so but I will say that it is important to actually form an opinion based on what you have seen, and I don't necessarily think a bad trailer makes a bad movie. I've seen plenty of terrible trailers that have ended up being great movies. I wish that was the case for this one. Roland Emmerich gave an interview that also rubbed people the wrong way. He gave it with The Independent and he said that my movie was exactly what they said it wasn't. It was politically correct. It had black transgender people in there. We just got killed by one voice on the internet who saw a trailer and said, this is whitewashing Stonewall. Stonewall was a white event, let's be honest, but nobody wants to hear that anymore. My point of view on that opinion is that it's definitely more complex you know i did just read earlier in the podcast a bunch of history that kind of contradicts that but i try to have a measured response to things and the actual film does in fact have people of color in it it has black people in it and it has technically a trans character this trans character is played by a cis man so that's bad i do plan to do an episode on a film that has a trans woman character being played by a cis man. I'm not going to discuss it in detail a lot here, but in general, bad idea. There are lots of really negative connotations with that depiction, and it does seem that a lot of cis men get praised for doing something so edgy and interesting, whereas a lot of trans women can't even get roles to play people that they actually even are. I'm gonna discuss it in detail in a second. I just, I want to talk about the way that whiteness is set up against the idea of race and what it means for the non-white characters in the film. We have Danny and Danny is not a real person. He was specifically created for the film and it seems to have been done this way because having a generic white character who is the most normal you could be outside of the fact that they're gay, seems to be a ploy to get more people to watch the film. If you got a white man in the lead, you're probably going to make more money because Hollywood kind of sees white, cis, straight men as like a default. Again, it's really hard to, <laughs> to discuss these terms, which are just adjectives because they are so loaded on the internet. I'm not going to caveat that by saying I personally don't think these people are like evil because I shouldn't have to say that. I'm simply stating a fact. <laughs> I think it is a truth that these people are just seen as default. They are seen as the norm and a way to kind of edge people into queerness without really challenging them that much is to have a character that is as close to the majority audience that you can get, which is a white man who is also gay, but you know, not in like a weird way. He's as normal as normal can be. He's a football player and he lives in his nice house with his with his dad and his mom and his sister. And he has like a fairly, I hate calling this like storyline generic because I don't believe that's true. And if the, if, if Danny was like an, an interesting character, then I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say this, but he has like a generic backstory where he's a closeted character who is very rich and his, his future hinges on the fact that he stays closeted. He's in love with his, his straight best friend and that they, they go and have sex in their car late at night 
and they're caught, he is outed and then kicked out of his house. Again, calling a story like that generic feels really insulting, but because this isn't a real person, it's a character, and we hate this character. <laughs> I don't hate him, he's just not He's just not a person and he's actually no i do hate him because he's very <laughs> he's really annoying and he is really terrible he's a really terrible friend he's kicked out of his house and he goes to new york and he immediately finds all of the gay people <laughs> like like he, he gets off the bus and there the gay people are that's that's how the film starts <laughs> the story of being closeted and falling in love with a straight man and having to have this secret tryst and having it being found out and having your dad hate you the most it is the most easily consumable story for straight audiences i think people understand that story they've probably heard it a million times having to relate to a black trans woman is probably harder for or is perceived as harder for audiences by producers of films like this they think that how how could an audience relate to this? How could an audience like stretch their imagination to to view this person that they they don't relate to at all as as a fully realized person? And my opinion is you do that by writing them as a person. And if you're a good filmmaker, you can give your characters interiority and by doing that, you invite us into their world. We don't need to have like certain demographics ticked off so that you will sell tickets and people will come and see your film. People will come and see your film if it's interesting and good and has flawed characters who, who don't just like yell at each other all the time. Can I just say that two characters having a fight is not the same as them being complex people. There are so many times in this film where characters will just like yell stuff really generic dialogue at each other about how one character has betrayed another character and how being gay is really hard that is the dialogue for like 90 minutes of the film it's not good <laughs> danny's cookie cutter generic life where he lives with his parents is set up in opposition to the criminal life of the homeless queers who live on christopher street they are shown to regularly be shoplifting being loud and disorderly smoking inside one of the earliest things we see kong do is throwing a brick through a window and stealing a hat which you know okay i mean that's blunt characterization oh but sure i would argue that no person would do this but whatever especially since this shop is located on the street where they seem to live it is sticky when you represent the characters of color as you know loud disorderly criminals and your your white character as like a tourist in this culture as like a, a a tourist to this we get to see how horrified he is by this behavior we get to see how he's shaped into throwing the first brick at stonewall how he has to observe the criminality of these characters once again i don't think on the surface of the of of this that having a character just randomly throw a brick through a window. It's very blunt characterization, but it's interesting if you do something with it. All it seems to be there for is to show Danny that throwing bricks at things is a decent way to get what you want. And that is the crux of the characters of color in this film. They exist to show the lead character how to live as a gay man in New York, how to adopt characteristics that they have, transplant them onto his own identity and, you know, package them in whiteness so that they're more palatable. All of these characters seem to serve as teaching moments for Danny and nothing really else. They don't seem to exist really at all outside of him. When you're showing a subjective experience it can be interesting to show the limits of their knowledge you know what they don't know but the fact that this is a it's a very specific experience and these characters do not exist outside of him 
is very unintentionally showing the arrogance of whiteness. How white people often see people of colour as just guiding hands towards more enlightened experiences. These people who again should be fully fleshed out characters just exist to radicalize this white man into doing the thing that apparently none of them have ever thought to do that he has to be the one to to take their experiences internalize them and then turn them into tangible radical politics something that they apparently have never been able to do for themselves it took this white man to come and actually materialize what it is they wanted, which is to stop being harassed by the police. I'm going to return to Marsha P. Johnson now. I discussed earlier her being played by a cis man. I think it adds a pretty sinister level to her character because it's honestly really shitty the way that they depicted her because she's almost cartoonish so far away from the story that it's honestly insulting to even include her i think the film would have gone down better probably not it would have been less abrasive to me had she just not been included at all because the characterization of her here is that she's like absent-minded and like silly and she was an activist right not only is she barely in this film when she is she is so like bastardized and just like pushed away from the center there's a scene where she's handcuffed to a mobster by the police as a way for the police to humiliate this man and I would argue the film does not challenge this point of view, that it's embarrassing to be handcuffed to this trans woman. She's only there for like comic relief. And I, I would argue that she's there to be laughed at. There is some catharsis in the fact that she just straight up punches Ed, the mobster, in the face. <laughs> it is like not satisfying because she's barely been in the story up to this point. And when she has, it's it's been like almost like embarrassing to watch i was honestly kind of pissed off i think lastly i'm gonna talk about ray i think ray has the most potential as a character i think that's to do with johnny beauchamp's performance i think that's how you pronounce his name he was definitely trying to bring something to the character it's a shame that the writing in this film is so fucking terrible but we do see glimpses into kind of his personality i'd say like the best scene in the film is the scene where danny and ray are like sleeping in the same bed and ray talks about his dreams for the future about how he would be happy to be like danny's housewife and if it meant like a life of security i think probably unintentionally that's the most telling part of the film because what it really evidences to us is that Ray is there to serve Danny and not much else. <laughs> he's also there to yell at Danny when he's a shitty person, but we're never made to see him as in the right. Because, like I said, the film is limited by Danny's perspective, and Danny's perspective is really fucking boring. So we ray is like the guiding hand of danny like he warns him about the mob he saves him from the sexual assault that he experiences at the same time he's constantly framed as unreasonable as the effeminate one in opposition to trevor who danny chooses over ray in a sense a lot of the characters only seem to exist for danny and ray is like a failure as a character specifically because he could have been something and he just ends up not being that. Characters only seem to exist to teach Danny lessons about life. For the filmmakers, his plight to go to university is more interesting than the rest of the characters, which is probably, you know, it's the virtues of being white, I guess. You're just seen as more interesting inherently, even if your story is objectively uninteresting. How is going to university a more interesting story than living lives of sex workers 
who were battling addiction and homelessness and trying to find joy in in small moments like going to the Stonewall Inn. How is that less interesting than what we got here? In 2016, Manola Dargis outlined a test called the Duvernay Test, named after Ava Duvernay. And it's a test that Hollywood films need to pass in order to have the baseline competent representation for characters of colour. It's similar to the Bechdel test. It seems to have been inspired by it. Now, I will give the caveat that along with the Bechdel test, they are parameters for measuring representation and don't necessarily mean anything about the quality of a piece. I want to emphasise that because I have watched many films that are allegedly very progressive in their representation but are absolutely dog shit awful or just like very generic (laughs) what i will state about this test is that it was more invented to emphasize the extent that white stories just seem to sell more and they seem to have more of a sway with audiences and what it says about people of colour in the real world when they have to live in a world that doesn't think their stories are important. So the criteria for the test are these three things. So one, the film must have complex characters. Stories that pass the test must feature at least two characters of colour and they must not be in a romantic relationship together. These characters must have complex lives rather than existing only in relation to white characters. Already we failed. (laughs) Two, these characters, they must have names. You might think, wow, that should be an easy one to do. You'd be surprised how many fail that one. This film does pass the second one. There are black characters, there are Latinx characters, and they have names. The bare minimum. (laughs) Three, speaking parts. Characters of colour must have dialogue and their conversations must not be about supporting a white character. Big fat fail for this film. That's just a truth. Here's the thing, I don't think that this was a deliberate indictment of whiteness. I think this was told from a legitimately sincere place and without irony, which is kind of what makes it more disappointing. It seems to be an unintentional exposure of the way that white people use radical politics and people of colour as a means for character development rather than actual liberation. Again, fully unintentional this was not the intended meaning of the film i know that that's like interpretation of a film is subjective but i think i can say that with confidence i don't think it was an intentional satire i think this was sincere and that is what makes it quite troubling (laughs) let's ask the question the first does it look like a badger of the year does this film look like a badger yes oh my god (laughs) Yeah, it is the worst film that I've done on the podcast so far. Really did not enjoy it. It is sterile, fully uninterested in its characters, violent, with no interest in exploring the power structures that make that violence. All of the characters feel underwritten and overperformed. And and honestly, the most damning thing is that this film doesn't feel like it was set in New York. It feels like it was made by someone who, who doesn't live there. And, you know, I don't live there, but I've seen enough films about New York to know, like, when a film feels like New York. This film doesn't. It feels like a soundstage, and that is an issue, because it makes the film feel as hollow as its politics, which is not good. Do not fret, though, because I have some recommendations for you. Better films done this one better media in general we love that we like watching things that are good and not things that are bad so the first recommendation is a short film called happy birthday marcia you might be able to guess what this film is about it's a fictionalized story of marsha p johnson who decides to have her birthday at the Stonewall Inn and it centers her experience at the beginning of the riots. It's a very nice film and 
it's told from the point of view of black trans women. They wrote the story and a trans woman plays Marsha as well, which is good. I would also recommend the short documentary called Behind Every Good Man. The reason I'm recommending this is because it was made in the 60s. It's a documentary about a black trans woman who is navigating her everyday life. I watched this last year during Pride Month and you know, it's the type of film where you're like just honestly astonished that it exists at all. You know, it's it's one of those that had to be like rediscovered because the legality of being a trans person is one thing, but then putting that on screen, <laughs> completely different. Just as like a treat because this film is so bad. I'm also going to recommend Pose, which is set slightly later than this film, but it is also historical fiction. It is set during the AIDS crisis and focuses on the ball scene in New York, which is something that, you know, I've discussed in passing on this podcast. And it has trans women of colour at its, at its centre. They lead the story. They are some of the best characters in the show. So yeah, I would recommend that one as well. This has been a long episode. I've been recording for a lot longer than I usually do. Thank you very much for listening. My next episode should be in February, where I'm doing queer romance. If you'd like to stay updated, please make sure to follow me on Twitter, at Like a Badge Pod. If you'd like to listen to more episodes, follow me on Spotify, YouTube, and I'm also on TikTok, where I post teasers for episodes before they come out, so follow me. <laughs> Follow me there if you want. If you'd like to read more of my work, you can find my writing at ambercomewalk.com. If you would like to give me money, donate to my coffee, put it in the show notes. All the things I've cited are also in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and I hope to see you in February. Bye!